This morning, I would like to share the word of God with us. And the topic of my message is the pace of faith. Each one of us, we have a journey with the Lord. Each one of us as believers, when we come to Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, number one, we hear that this is a walk of faith. This is a journey of faith, and we understand that. But sometimes we also want things to happen immediately. We want things to happen right here and right now. It's almost like an exchange. It's almost like God saving us from eternal separation from him. It's not enough. We need more, something more tangible, something immediate to prove that he's still God, to prove to us that he's still faithful. And we, at times... Not that we forget, but we're not aware of our own struggles, that our journey as believers is a pace of faith. It's one day at a time. It's one day at a time. And whenever when we approach our faith in this perspective, that it's going to be a journey, we will be comforted. The Holy Spirit will comfort us to live this life trusting the Lord and trusting in his plan. If you can open up with me, Mark chapter 9, verse 33 and down. Mark, the gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 33 and down. And it says this, Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was you disputing or arguing or disagreeing among yourselves on the road? And they're looking at Jesus, how do you know that? (laughs) They're probably thinking, you know what? We're on a journey to Capernaum to see Jesus. And among them, they're having this tense fellowship like some of us maybe had it this morning, coming to the house of the Lord. And when we come to the house of the Lord, maybe the Holy Spirit is asking me and all of us, what were you disputing in your mind? What were you disputing among yourselves? What's not enough that I'm giving to you? What are some of the things that you're going through in your life that it seems so frustrating on the journey to Capernaum, on the journey to Times Square Church Summit Campus, on the journey when you're driving for half an hour, 40 minutes, 45, one hour, those that are from Lancaster area, Lebanon area, 15, 20 minutes. What are some of the things that me and you are talking about or having an idea what we should look like, what we should be, Or what God owns us as an exchange of us saying yes to follow him. And we come to church into this building and all of a sudden we raise our hands and we say, oh, all the praises we give to you. We open our mouth and we sing praises to the Lord and and God sees the depth of our hearts. You see, we cannot fool him. We are clever even to fool our spouse sometimes. But that cleverness is not of God. (laughs) It's a full of flesh, okay? But God sees it all. He knows it all. He he was involved in the conversations that happened on our journey here. And when we gather here, as we lift our voices to the Lord, as we lift our hands to Him and we sing to Him, deep inside of our hearts, He's asking, what were you talking about? What were you thinking? What are the struggles you're going through? It's going inside of your heart, inside your mind. What are those things that you're fighting with yourselves? You're trying to seek acknowledgement in front of people. What are so some of those things? And they're looking at each other. How did Jesus know that? They were probably surprised and shocked. I think if we can be more aware sometimes in our life, in everyday life, you know how he says, pray without ceasing? And sometimes we think, what does it mean that I'm going to close myself into a closet, not eating, not spending time with the family? What does it look like? I think our general overseer, Pastor Carter Collins, says it best. It's every day being aware of your presence and talking to him in whatever things that you do. And it's amazing how many things changes in our life when we do that. But I think same thing, if we can only be aware that Jesus knows it all, how many things in my life, in your life, will change. How many things we will not think about? How many things we will not desire? How many things we will not strive for? But we would be content, as the Bible calls me and you to be. 
Say it with me, content. With more confidence. <laughs> content. We would be content. And it always will start by us being aware that God sees us. God knows us. As much as he he's with us in the church service, he is with us in the car at home. Let me take it a little further. Do you know that you brought Jesus to this place? It's not like magically he's in these four walls when it's empty. And you are leaving everything behind to come and meet with God. No, we are coming here because the Bible commands us to gather together. Not to forsake the assembly of the holy people as the body of Jesus Christ. So we are coming and gathering in the obedience to the Lord. But it's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And when we show up to this place, we don't leave God at the door. Well, let me put it this way. We don't gain God at the door. But we possess the power of God and we come inside. And as believers, as one body now, we are worshiping him, glorifying him, encouraging one another in faith and in the Lord. And only if we can be aware that he's with us, whatever where we are. Maybe some of the fighting and the thoughts and all of the things that are going through our minds, we would not do. Because we would not have to fake it when we come together as a body. But the worship doesn't start at 10.30 when we invite you to stand. The worship starts when we gave our life to Jesus Christ. It's all of our lives. I've heard not too long ago that I'm still pondering about that worship is deeper. It's every time when we say no to temptation, every time when we say no to some of the things that the Bible is calling us to be separated from. It's a worship to the Lord. It's not a song. How many of us are bounded by so many things that we are playing with and then we come and we only limit worship to be 30 minutes on Sunday morning and we're mistaking and we're losing so much joy that can be found in what it truly means to worship him. And it's in those moments like these disciples, whenever when they were seeking for positions and arguing on a road and Jesus saw them. But worship would be, let us not argue, let us honor God. And that's a form of worship right there. Then he came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. <laughs> Sometimes it's so good to just be silent, right? Even Solomon says that if you're silent, even if you don't have a lot of wisdom, you will consider to be the wisest man. If you only can learn one thing, to be silent. For on the road, they had the spirit among themselves, who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, You see, only a few disputed, but he had to call all of them and address all of them. And then he says, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. My brother, my sister, if you want to be first, you will be last. You will be the servant of all. Sometimes we have it upside down. We think if we have the power, the authority, and if we, we, can, we can be the greatest in front of people. No, it's about how God sees us. And the kingdom of God, it's always about servanthood. Verse 36. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms... He said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. It's a whole depth that Jesus is bringing a revelation for an argument. Do you know that there can be a revelation from your argument that you might have had this week? There can be a depth of revelation. The power of forgiveness, of covering the fault of somebody else. Even in the midst of confusion and argument and conflict, God can still come and teach us a lesson. God can still come and remind us of his faithfulness even in a moment of conflict. And he takes this little child and, he, and he's saying the kingdom of God is like that. Be simple. What are, the, what are some of the things usually that children would teach us? In this context, humility. Not to think of ourselves more than we are to. 
humility. Another thing we can say that simplicity. Children are simple. They don't know what it means to stay still like we would want them all the time. They can run up and down the aisle like my kids do so often in a front, you know. I was looking this morning, the elders are getting the communion ready and all of a sudden the children are just walking around. They don't know what it means. Hey, maybe pause for a minute. They're children. It talks about the simplicity. It talks about the pureness of heart. It talks about that, listen, don't be so religious in your life. Don't seek positions. Don't be after all of these things that man will honor. But be simple because God sees it all. Man sees the appearance. But God sees the heart. The heart. And also children, they trust. They trust. I was watching the other day a clip that somebody did a study and they began to ask some of the parents of if I can come and pick up your child with your permission to show you that your kids are, are so simple, they're so trustworthy, that they're just going to sit with me in a car and I will tell them that I'm going to drive them home from school and they're going to do that. And the parents are like, they will never do that. They will never do that. And they put all these cameras and they were doing a test. They were doing a study and they're bringing awareness to the parents, especially in Pennsylvania with all the craziness that is going on here, one of the worst areas for all of this nonsense. You know what I talk about, right? Because there's a lot of kids here. But they did this, this study and they put all these videos and all of a sudden the car pulls up at the school stop, whatever the kids were waiting for their parents. And they opened the window and they said, hey, your mom called me. They, she cannot come and pick you up, but she sent me to pick you up. The kids were like, look at each other. Okay. And they just sat in a car and all of a sudden this stranger began to drive them. Why? Because kids sometimes trust very easily. And God is teaching us that we are to trust him. As children, we'll trust the stranger sometimes, and we must teach them not to do that, right? But we can take a, a deep example. We can take a deep lesson from this and say, no, we are to trust our Father in heaven. The same as children trust the parents and their friends. Let me take a step further and say, even in a deeper way. So I began to study and I began to do a little bit of research. What are some of the things that children have, the qualities of children that they have? And they said that they're friendly. Children are friendly. Another thing the study shows is that the joy of simple pleasures. They see a rock and all of a sudden they're rejoicing. Because they're thinking and they're already thinking ahead that they'll pick this rock and throw it to a window and there will be a bang. Right? They see all the potential of the things. Another thing, they are happy and content. They don't need to ask for the best mattress. They will fall asleep even on the floor sometimes. And they're content. Children are fearless. They're fearless. Sometimes you will tell them not, not to do those things because those things are danger. And even more so, you almost like a magnet draws them to all of those things that you told them, hey, those things are danger, don't do that. They're fearless. They appreciate the little things. I was watching a video of Samaritan Purse, what they do around the world. And Times Square Church is a part of these gifts during Christmas season that they're getting. And it's amazing when they open these boxes and the joy that they have. This clip was saying that whenever when the war broke in Israel and in Gaza and all the traumatic things that the children had to go through, they were saying that children were not smiling because of pain, confusion, fear. And Frank and Graham and others, they were just sharing that for the first time during the season of Christmas when they brought them gifts for the first time they were filled with joy with joy what does it tell us that they appreciate the little things and that's what jesus is teaching the disciples that want to seek positions he says no enjoy the little things like children they express their emotions they're very open about emotions if you did something wrong they will tell you even this morning I made a deal with my daughter. 
I said, she's like, can I stay with you during the church service? I said, yes, only if you stay with us. She got clever somehow, and she's sitting with her friends in the back. <laughs> then she came to me a few minutes ago, right before I was speaking, and I said, if you want to stay here, you have to stay with us. She says, no, please, let me stay with my friends. I said, okay, but we will have a talk at home. And she looks at me, daddy, no talking talk at home, okay? No talking talk. <laughs> They're simple. They will tell you what they think. They're not holding anything back. They're honest. They're honest. Not always, but they're honest. <laughs> also, the study shows that they're curious and excited. They get excited about anything. And they're very good at expressing themselves. Even when they're hurt. Even when they're pouting. Even when things do not go their way. And one of the greatest things that I love about children, they're good learners. Now they can learn good things or, help me, or bad things. bad things. But they learn. They learn. And in this context, Jesus is talking about to these disciples that are grown up people about children. But also our children are courageous. Our children, they know how to laugh. They can be joyful at any moment. And also they're there to accept help when needed. And when we as parents, we can run to them and they can scream help or whatever the case might be. They are there to accept this help. And now I want to look to this scripture again. That there are disciples that are fighting for positions. That are fighting for titles. They're de debating and all of a sudden they come in the presence of Jesus like us today. And Jesus sees the heart. And one of the best examples for the kingdom of God to be represented. He takes this child and he says, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Because he took this child in his hands and he's trying to express to them a lesson. A lesson. Because children can care less about all of those things. They just want to enjoy life. My brother, my sister, how much in our life we can learn from children in the kingdom of God. As I've talked, even as Google tells us all of these qualities that children can bring to us. Those are good examples even spiritually. But now, the very next chapter, okay, the very next chapter, this is in chapter 9, Mark chapter 9. Now let's move to Mark chapter 10. And I did not see this before, but while studying and reading through preparing for today, I saw something, and I want to share, maybe just me, but I think it's a pretty good thought. And I would like to share this thought with you. Now if you can open up Mark chapter 10, verse 22 Mark chapter 10, excuse me, verse 13 says this. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, let's stop here. So I think, in my opinion, one has to do with the other. Because these disciples are fighting for positions. You see, this journey, it's a pace of faith. One day we will reign with Christ. It was not the time and the season for the disciples to seek those positions naturally in the world. It's not for us while we're here to seek positions that are not given to us. But one day when we're going to be with Jesus, we will rule and reign, the Bible says, with him. But there was not the time for the disciples. And you see, through children, Jesus is rebuking them and correcting them. And now, all of a sudden, in chapter 10, I don't know how long, maybe it took a few days, a few hours, a few weeks. I don't know how long it took. But again, they're bringing children. And all of a sudden, the disciples are like, no, oh, I'm not getting corrected again because of children. Oh, no, I'm not going to be rebuked by Jesus because children are again are approaching him. Oh, no, I'm not going to let children come to Jesus because I have my ideas how this should go. 
We're going to protect our Savior. We're going to protect Jesus from the little ones. I do not want another lesson here. Jesus, I've had enough. I don't want children to teach me a lesson. I don't want children to impact my character. I don't want children to impact my worship. I don't want children to impact my simplicity to you. I do not want children to bother us when we gather together. I do not want children to change our mind about some of the things the way we grown-ups think. And all of a sudden, I think one has to do with the other. Because they were so embarrassed, they got maybe so hurt in that moment of kind of like, how does Jesus know what we were struggling and talking and fighting about? And Jesus is bringing a child. And now children wants to come over here and the disciples are like, no, no, we're not going through another lesson. We're not going to let children come and teach us how to live, and about the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but this scripture all of a sudden became so alive in, our, in my mind, in my heart, that God uses children to teach us about his kingdom and about the body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is continuing. He says this. Let me read from the beginning, verse 13. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But Jesus, when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, my brother and my sister, every time when children want to come to Jesus and we're trying to control that process, the Bible says over here that Jesus was displeased of the disciples doing that. He was displeased. And then he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took. See, Jesus did not just spoke about children. He did not agree with the disciples to keep the kids away from him. But he's again rebuking them. Again, he's teaching the disciples another lesson because in chapter 9, they did not understand fully the lesson of what the kingdom of God is all about. And again, indirectly, you see, in, in, in chapter 9, he's taking a child and he's teaching them a lesson. In chapter 10, even before the children come there, he's already teaching them a lesson again about the kingdom of God. And then I love this scripture, and I'm going to go into the closing. But I love this scripture. It says this, and he took, say with me, took. And he took them up in his arms. It reminds me of a sheep as well, that as Jesus says, he leaves the 99 and goes and seeks the one, and he picks it up in his arm, and he pulls it on his shoulder, and he brings it, right? And he says, and he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and bless them. And bless them. It's power. There is power where we understand the power of the kingdom of God. The power of the kingdom of God. It's not for adults. It's not just for the elderly. But it's for our family. It's for our children. And it's for the middle age. It's for all of us, my brother, my sister. The kingdom of God, it's available to all of our family, not to certain ones. And as Jesus took these children, as the disciples were afraid again that they were going to get corrected maybe, and not to bother Jesus or maybe having fear again, he's going to talk to them about their insecurities and what they were fighting about again on the road when they were meeting here, Jesus. Oh, kids are coming. No, 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 no. Let's, let's shut the doors. Let's push them out. No, but Jesus says, let them come. Let them come. And he took them in the arms. He did not say, when they come, you put them in a corner in the back. And you kind of forget about them. But he says that he took them in his hands. Say with me, hands. Because our children, they need a touch. They need a touch. They need a touch. So he took them in their hand. And then he says, he put his hands on them. And bless them. And bless them. I know a lot of you do that, and I do that as well. When we go to sleep, I lay my hands on my children. I bless them in the name of the Lord. 
I also teach my children to lay their hands on each other and to pray and to bless them. This is what we're called to do, to bless our children. Not to keep them away, but to bless our children. And I'm going to go to the last passage and read very quickly. And I'm going to share my heart with you in the end of why I'm sharing this message. Now Jacob and Esau, they were in conflict. There was great separation between them. And years have passed by and now their father passed away and it comes a moment that they have to reconcile. And maybe some of us are here in this room or online that we can learn from this passage and we can reconcile with our family. I don't have this in my notes, but I feel in my heart to stop for a moment and talk to you about that. It might be years that you have not spoken with your brother or your sister, or with your children. The gospel is about reconciliation. It's not about dividing, but it's about reconciliation. You don't have to agree with everything. I'm not talking about walking agreement. I'm talking about walking forgiveness and reconcile. When you want to do harm, when you want to bring division, when you want to stay apart, pray that God will help you to pick up that phone. If you don't have the courage to meet them for coffee or for lunch, to say, forgive me. You know, sometimes we think that's very low and very weak to do that. But actually, we're very strong when we do that, when we say, forgive me. We exhibit maturity. We exhibit spiritual maturity. We exhibit the qualities of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we do that. So now there are two brothers. Esau has the intentions to come against his brother and kill him. And Jacob is pleading with God for mercy. He's pleading for mercy. And I'm not going to read what I have planned to read the whole thing. But I'm going to stop in a few verses. Verse 10. And Jacob said, whenever when they met to each other, they exchanged some words, they began to weep. And they began to just, just have a moment of reconciliation. And verse 10 and down. And Jacob said, no, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand because you wanted to, to give him a present. Inasmuch as I have been your, seen your face as though I have seen the face of God. This is a picture also of God in us because we are all, we're like Esau. We were enemies with God. It's a picture of us that whenever when we come to him, he shows us mercy. And you were pleased with me. Please take my blessings that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me. And because I have enough, so he urged him and he took it. Verse 12. And this is what I want to talk to you about. Then Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go. And I will go before you. You know, so there is a type of people. It's, it's, it's a huge leadership lesson in the scripture as well. But I'm going to talk about in the context of a family. There's some type of people that always want to go. They're driven people. It's always go, go, go. Achieve the goals. We want to reign. We want to rule right here. Jesus. We want to do all of these things. We argue. And we miss the important things. Esau did not see the importance of all of the families but he saw the importance of just going because he was in a spirit of a war he was in a spirit of ruling he was in a spirit of reigning and power and authority but now jacob a man that has been changed and marked by the power of the holy spirit this is what he says but jacob said to him my lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me and if the man should drive them hard one day all the flock will die please let my lord go on ahead before his servant i will lead on slowly say with me slowly slowly one more time say with me slowly slowly our children need to be led slowly my brother my sister and at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to.
to endure. Say with me, endure. Endure until I come to my Lord in Sayer. This has been a scripture that spoke to me so much. And as a church, I've shared my heart in the past so many times that we are a family church. We're not a church just for young. We're not a church just for kids. We're not a church just for the elderly. But a healthy church represents all ages, all nations, all kinds of races, race, black, white, brown, whatever. This is a healthy church where we can all gather together with our differences, with our weakness. Worship one God who is powerful, faithful, and able to baptize us in the Holy Spirit to walk in unity. And as Isa wanted to drive and to go forward, a true leader, a true pastor will see those that cannot go fast. We see those that are weak. We see those that are frail. And we will walk together. And for that reason, this morning I want to share my heart that it's been there for a while. I've been talking with some leaders and praying and thinking things through. Because it's not in our culture so often to have our little ones with us here in the service. The perception in our culture, especially in 70s and 80s when this became popular, Sunday school. Let me tell you, it was not always like that. It was not always like that. This idea became about 40, 50 years ago when the church began to grow, the mega churches began to grow. When a lot of children maybe were perceived as they're a bother, so they were pushed away from the main service. But as a result right now, if you look in America, if you look in our state, if you look around so many churches, are filled with middle-aged and elderly people. The young people are not there. And we are responsible for that. Somehow we are responsible for that. Number one, as parents. Number two, as the leaders of the church. Because somehow we brought a division. The moment we walked through the doors of the church, we came up with a brilliant idea that there should be a division between the little ones and the older ones in the church service. Because we want to take a break. I think we have enough break when we drop them at school, when already the society is teaching them. And when we meet them at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock, we have dinner. 7 o'clock, they have to go to sleep. So in a good day, 3, 4 hours, we will spend with the children. But I want to encourage you and I want to share my heart that that's not healthy. We have to include our children in our everyday life. And that also impacts our services. Yes, our services. So children can see us, how we argue at home, and how we worship in service. Right? So children can see us, how we ask forgiveness when we're wrong at home, and how we can come in boldness and still lift our hands and worship the Lord, because we're not going to pretend. So children can see us when we love the Lord. And why do I say these things? About two months ago, I was invited to speak in Massachusetts and the children were with us in service. And I was preaching, I was sharing the word of God and after service, my daughter, my oldest daughter, eight years old, she just turned eight that week and that's why they were with us. She gave me a list, she said, daddy, daddy here. And I'm thinking, she's probably drawing, you know, sometimes we, we give kids to draw just for them to be busy. We think that they're, you know, sometimes a bother. And I'm looking. The church is going on. Come on. Some reverence. And she's so excited. Daddy, daddy, no, look over here. I took notes. And I'm thinking, what kind of notes? So I'm taking a reading. And all of a sudden, I find myself getting emotional because I began to read. And she took notes of all my sermon. All my sermon. And then in the end, she came to the conclusion. I did not even share that to the best of my knowledge. But she came to the conclusion in the end. She says, the kingdom of God 
it's all about forgiveness. And I began to cry and I began to think about that sometimes we as disciples of Jesus Christ are saying, no, 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 you're, you're too young, you don't know much. And that began to change something and confirm something in my heart where I have been feeling for the church. For the past few days on Friday and Saturday, we've been having youth conferences here. And I had the chance to say, it's a youth conference. I'm going to keep my little ones at home. No, but I showed up. I have a baby that is not even two years old. The baby needs to go to sleep at 7.30. But I decided to bring them to church. The baby was sleeping in my office. I was checking back and forth. But my eight-year-old and my five-year-old daughter, they were here. And sometimes we think, what can they understand from a message? And I was sitting there and all of a sudden I look up front and I see my five-year-old daughter. She just turned five not too long ago. She just had the altars here. And I'm thinking as a good dad, well, I'm going to go and just hug her, encourage her, and talk with her about the Lord. But I did not know what's going to happen next, that I would begin to weep with her. Because when I gave her a hug, all of a sudden I began to hear that she was just weeping. Five years old, responding to the altar call, and she weeps, and she cries. And I just laid my hands on her like Jesus did on the children. I took her in my hand and I began to pray for her and bless her. And then we began to talk. Why were you crying? Why did you come to the altars? I don't know. She says, I just felt the presence of God. I can't explain this. God. And she, it was Jesus. The best she can, she just expresses herself. It was Jesus. I want to obey. I want to love. I want to learn more. Daddy, would you do that more with me? Would you read to me? Would you tell me more about Jesus? And sometimes we think that even our five years old, they're so, they're so little, they cannot understand a whole lot. But let me tell you, they can. They can. They can understand. They can grasp. And it's a great moment and opportunity. Let them make noise. Let them shout. Let them do whatever. As long as they're in the house of God. As long as they're in the house of God. Let me take a step further. If we are bothered by the noise that the children are making in the house of the Lord, remember this. One day we might be making wailing noises in the house of the Lord for them because they're not here. Let us pick the battles. The body of Jesus Christ, it's about all ages, all people. Old and young and children, all of us. And God can touch our children. And for that reason, I would like to ask with your blessing that once a month we're going to have a family day. The children are already coming to service during worship here. But once a month, we're going to have a family day at Times Square Church Summit Campus where the first Sunday of the month, all of our children from the, from the ages 5 and up, if they go to the first grade, I would like for them to be in church with you as parents. Not over here by themselves, but with you as parents. And if you as parents, if you would like to come and, and sit closer that Sunday on the front with them to worship and to, to just be with them, please do that. But once a month, we're going to have a family day. All of our children, first grade and up, they're going to join us here in the main service in the sanctuary. And then after service, going to the summers, we're going to have a potluck, food, games, a family day. And we're going to invite our children to church. Not to Sunday school, but to church. To church. We're going to invite the children to come and worship with us. We're going to invite the children to walk with us. We're going to invite our children to go at their pace. We're going to ask the Lord to give us a heart the way he gave to Jacob. Not a heart of Esau that will drive and go forward and seek authority and power. Not a heart that will fight for positions. Not a heart that will seek quietness because we're bothered. My brother and my sister, we are already secure. We are already saved. Our children need to get saved.
And for that reason, I'm inviting you as brothers and sisters. We are going to go at the pace of our children. So none of us will be lost. So none of them will be lost. So none of them will be just cast out. No, we are going to walk with them. Amen. Praise be to God. I know it took a little longer, but this is a sobering message. And I want to finish with this thought. We do this in faith. Because right now we might not see the results. But we do this in faith. The pace of faith. You see the disciples in the first story, they wanted to rule and reign with Jesus immediately. Immediately. They were seeking for those positions. And Jesus brought a child to bring them an example that no, it's not the time and it's not even my job to do that. It's my father's. But one day when we get to heaven, the Bible says we will rule and reign with him. You see, it's a pace of faith. Sometimes we want the immediate to be right now, right here. Our children to be perfect. Well, look at us. Look in the mirror. It's a pace of faith, my brother, my sister. And we're going to do all of these things in faith. We're going to sow in faith and reap with joy. When our children are going to be teenagers, they're going to be with us loving God. This is a pace of faith. I'm calling you to a journey of faith with me. Will we have noises? Yes. But let's embrace those noises. Let's embrace those noises. And one day when they're going to grow, they're not going to be out there, not being connected to church because every Sunday parents disconnected them walking into the door to a house of God. But we're going to get them acquainted with the main service in the sanctuary to love God and love God people. Father, we thank you for your promise and we thank you for your word that teaches us how to live this life. God, from time to time, we fail. We don't know how to do this. As parents, we fail. As pastors, we fail. But God, we come to your word. There is a direction into our lives and we want to learn. And I pray, oh God, for the courage. And I want to thank you that you've been speaking to me for a long time about this, God, but I've been just trying to figure out how to do this. Lord, but this is your church. This is not my church. You died for this church. God, I pray that we will walk together with our children, with our little ones, that we will not drive them to a speed that they cannot walk. But God, I pray that once a month we can embrace our family, to have this family day. That our messages here will be simple, that our children can understand and that they can get acquainted with being together with the brothers and sisters, with the parents and others, worshiping you because that's what a healthy church looks like. We love you, Lord, and we praise you for who you are, for your faithfulness and for your word. God, we thank you. That in your mercy and your grace, you speak to us. Oh God, we thank you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. By this time, I'm going to ask Elder Sonia, if you can go and bring all the kids up, please, for me. And we're going to sing the song, Lord bless you, in a moment. But I'm going to ask you something to do. And what we're going to practice doing as Jesus said, he took them in his hand and he blessed them. And if you're a parent, our kids are going to come here up front. And if, if you are here as a father, mother, grandmother, I'm going to ask you to do something in faith. To come, stand next to your children, lay your hands on them and bless them. And bless them and love on them. And if you need to apologize before you do this prayer, to them because they're kids. They understand everything. They know everything. Do that. Don't be afraid to let them know when you're wrong. And we're going to be praying for them. We're going to be blessing them. Amen. But I also want to talk to you now. If you might be here that your children are not walking with the Lord. 
and you might be blaming yourself and you might be hard on yourself about, about this. I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't give up. Some of you might be beating yourself because those years you feel like they're gone and now they're older, now they're teenagers and it almost seems like the time is lost. No, but God can redeem the time. God is able and faithful to redeem the time. Keep on praying for them. Keep on knocking. Keep on believing. Because our journey, as I said, is a pace of faith. It's a pace of faith. It's one step at a time. One step at a time. But we will finish strong. We will finish strong. Because our children belong to the Lord. Our families belong to the Lord. Our marriages belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. Our communities belong to the Lord. Our colleges belong to the Lord. High schools belong to the Lord. Our nations belong to the Lord. Because Jesus says that he came to save that which was lost. And at one point, all of us were lost. But his desire is to save us. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together as our children come. You guys come this way. All of our children, come, come to the front over here. They're probably like, what is going on? I'll explain to you in a minute. There was a time where we were about 20 people in this church. Now, each Sunday, I'm told, we have from 40 to 50 children in the church. Isn't it an amazing thought? Now, if you're a parent and you have children over here, I would like to ask you if you can stand and come behind them or in the front of them. Come, don't be afraid. Mom, dad, grandparents. If you have a family here, if you have a somebody that you would like to ask them to join you, you come. You lay your hands on your children now. Now the church, would you stand please with me? And what we're going to do as parents are laying their hands on their children, are going to bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Jesus did. Now what I'm going to ask you to do, you stretch out your hands toward the children. All of us, my brother, my sister, all of us, stretch your hands. And now we're going to be praying a blessing over our children. In a moment, we're going to sing this song. But first, we're going to be praying for our children. We're going to be praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to come and baptize them. For the power of the Holy Spirit to come and fill their hearts and lives. Let your voices, my brother, my sister. Let's fight for this generation. Let's fight for our children. Oh God, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And first and foremost, we want to thank you for the children that you had given us. It's a gift from you, oh Father. We thank you that you have blessed our marriages. We thank you that you have blessed our children. We thank you that they are healthy. We thank you that they can talk. We thank you that they can walk. We thank you that they can eat, oh Father. We thank you for the laughter that it's in our homes. In the name of Jesus, we come to you right now, oh Father. And we're asking you, let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon our children. We pray, oh God, that the mercy of God will be upon our children. Let the keeping power of God be upon our children, oh Father. Let the love of Jesus Christ fill their hearts and mind and soul. We pray that you would keep them, oh God. We pray that you would baptize them with a supernatural love that only can come from you, oh God. We cannot keep them in church, oh Lord. We cannot force them to come here. But your spirit can fill their hearts with a desire that only can come from you to love you and to love people, oh God. I pray that our children will be protected in the house of God. I pray, oh God, that you would protect them from biting and, and division. I pray, oh God, that you would protect their minds and their hearts from all of the negative things that can happen, oh Father. But I pray that you would fill their hearts with love, 
love towards the house towards the house of God with love towards you oh God with love towards ministry and serving others oh God we don't want to be here without our children we don't want to be alone oh father but you had given them to us as a gift and we bring them back to you because they belong to you oh God they belong to you and we bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ oh father we thank you for them we thank you that you're speaking to them. We thank you that you're touching them. We thank you, Father, that you're filling their hearts with love already. We thank you, Father, that even either they're here or downstairs, you are still faithful to keep them, oh Father. Bless them now. Fill them with your power. Fill them with the ability to speak in different tongues. Fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh God Almighty, I pray, fill them with the fire of God. Oh Jesus, that they will live their lives fully given to you. They are not too young for the gospel. They are not too young to be filled with your strength, with your mercy, with your forgiveness, with your power. They are not too young, O oh Father, because your kingdom, it's about them, O oh Father. Oh, we thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Continue to pray, my brother, my sister. Let your voices continue to bless them. Continue to pray for them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, O oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace in our man Amen 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 children and their children and their children
Lord, we thank you for every young child at the altar today. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the families represented in this church. God, and I just pray you're covering over every single one in a world and in a culture that has so much to say. God, we speak Jesus over every single child. In the name of Jesus, pray for the protection of the Holy Spirit to be upon each one of them. God, and as they, they grow to place their faith in you, as they grow to, to know you as their Savior, God, I pray that they wouldn't have to taste of the things that this world has to offer to find out that you are good. You say to taste and see that the Lord is good. I pray that they don't have to taste of anything else. I pray that you guard them in their purity. I pray that you protect them physically, emotionally, spiritually. Every lie of the enemy, every lie of the culture that would try to say anything other than what you have spoken over them, we command in the name of Jesus for those lies to be gone. And only what the Father, the Heavenly Father has to say about them. God, we love you. We love you. I thank you that we don't have to be a statistic. God, our families, we can grow together and we can love you with all of our hearts. God, and so we bless you. God, our lives are yours. Our children's lives are yours. It all belongs to you, God. And we do it for your glory. We love you and we bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.